Okay, uh, I'm not Doncho, as it says on the board. Um, this is a big group, actually uh, bigger than I remember. Um, my name is Alon, I'm a senior developer here at Telerik. I'm on the Sitefinity team, whoever hasn't seen me before. And uh, my lectures are in English. Uh, not because I don't speak Bulgarian, but because I don't speak Bulgarian well. And um, we'll talk today about multidimensional arrays. Everybody's been to the first arrays lecture, I hope. So you know what arrays are all about. Um, today we'll talk about some more advanced topics uh, regarding arrays. Uh, we'll see multidimensional arrays. Uh, specifically two-dimensional, but doesn't have to, to stop in two dimensions. We'll see what they are and how they behave and what to do with them. We'll see jagged arrays, which are actually arrays of arrays. And we'll talk a little bit about the array class. We'll see some functionality on the array class. Um, some of the demos that we're going to see are not actually listed and we're going to have to go through them together, which is good because We'll have to see some more features which are not listed in the presentation. And uh, I think they'll have, we'll have to give some, I will have to give some additional explanations to the ones that are covered in the presentation because we're going to see a little bit of interfaces, a little bit of functions, um, even uh, lambda expressions, which are quite advanced topic in C sharp, but we're going to see them just at the edge of the iceberg or whatever the expression is. So, let's start with multidimensional arrays. Uh, well, that explains it. Yeah. You can stay. Okay. So, uh, we've seen arrays um, which are collections of objects of the same type. Um, that, com that comes in handy when you have a big collection of objects which have to be of the same type. Uh, usually arrays are, are organized in memory in a serial uh, way so um, that means that they are the objects are actually stored in memory one after another and since we know the size of the object that we are um, that we want to access whether it's a pointer or a reference whether it's an integer or a long then we can access any object in the array uh, quite fast once we know the offset of the object from the beginning we, and we know how many objects we want to count so we can always access uh, an object in the array in a very high performance time. Arrays are good for high accessibility of, of objects in, in short time. Mm, you understand why? So if we have this array in memory and we want to reach the third element in it we, and we know that these are integers and each integer is 32 bits, we can just, <coughs> since we can easily calculate 32 bits times 3 and we can access the third part of the array quite fast without having to, to get references to follow, um, to follow memory pointers and such. That, that usually makes them efficient. Mm, there are other collections in C-sharps uh, that you will uh, get to know, which are more functional than arrays in many ways. And you can create your own collections and your own enumerations, and that makes life quite easy for the c -sharp programmer and gives a lot of flexibility. But arrays are the most basic and the most um, elementary ones, and many of the collections, which are other collections, like lists, can be converted into arrays in one uh, function call. So, so um, so that's about arrays, which you should already know. Um, Multidimensional arrays store data not only in one dimension, that means not only serially one after the other, but also virtually in different rows. That is in the case that we have two dimensions, but we can have also three dimensions. Um, if we are looking at a two-dimensional array, we can picture a matrix, we can picture a table of data, if we are picturing a three-dimensional array, we can picture a three-dimensional body, like a cube, where you can point every cube, every item with three dimensions uh, regarding, regarding its location. 
Um, if we're talking about fourth and fifth dimension arrays, this is for the physicists here, I guess, because uh, picturing a fifth, a five dimensions um, object is not trivial. But still, you can you can create arrays with more than two dimensions. Um, that means that in order to access any object in the array, you need to specify, for example, five different accessors, five different indexes. So they are useful for whenever you need, but, and they do exist, and you should know. The most common ones used are multi-dimensional, uh, are two-dimensional arrays, uh, because they represent matrices which come in handy, for example, on screen representation. If you guys have seen um, the, the Tetris game that I built for the previous part of the course. If you haven't, I can show it to you. Um, it uses a lot of two-dimensional arrays because it prints all uh, two-dimensional shapes on the screen, and that's, that comes in quite handy for many tasks. <coughs> so, we, how do we declare multi-dimensional arrays, we do it pretty much as, mu as the same way we declare a single dimension array. The only thing is that we can uh, specify the dimensions by putting a comma or multiple commas. So here we have a two-dimensional array of integers. So we are defining a matrix of numbers. Here we do the same with floats. And here we are actually defining a three-dimensional arrays of strings. So this is just a collection of strings, and to reach each one of those in the collection, we need to specify three different indexes. Um, and this is how they are initialized. Um, to initialize an array, we could use uh, one of two methods. One of them is using the new keyword. Um, it's actually an operator. So here we are defining the two-dimensional array of integers, and we are initializing it to have three <coughs> rows, and in each row we have four columns. That's of course virtual because they are not <coughs> real rows and columns. You can you can access them and you can you can relate to them as you want. You should just know that in this matrix we have the first indexer is three, so we have three different parts of the array, and on each one of them we have four elements. So it does uh, come down to a three on four matrix. Same goes here. We have a float. So we are defining a float matrix. Again, two dimensional and we have eight. Call it for now rows. And in each row we have two columns. So that could help picturing it. And the three-dimensional array of strings initialized here by my favorite number five into a cube. So we have here a collection of 125 strings. And you can access each one of them serially by um, indicating three different indexes from zero to four. That's clear so far. OK, another way to initialize arrays uh, multidimensionally is to just place data directly in them, um, which is comfortable, because as you can see, it's much more visual now to see exactly what the array contains. So our array of, in of integers here, which is two-dimensional, we could see that it has two different rows. So actually, if we would initialize it with a new operator, we would put here two. And then we have four different objects in each row. These are our columns. And here we would have to place the number four. And right now, we are putting here a direct initialization of the data into the array. And after this line is, is executed, this array is full of data. And that's it. By the way, you could, in, you could initialize a single dimensional array like this. I don't remember if it was, uh, if it was demonstrated in the arrays lecture, 
but you could initialize a single dimensional array like this. So this is actually like initializing each of the array's dimensions. Accessing the data, um, again, pretty much the same as you would do it on a single dimension array. Um, again, you should you need to specify um, you need to specify data by two indexers or more. So if you have a two-dimensional array of integers, we could access an integer in the place one, one. So this is this actually the second row and the second column because the indexes go from zero to arrays to the dimension minus one. Uh, if we want to scan an array, uh, if, we have a, if we have a single um, dimension array and we want to scan it with a loop, have you seen such an example? I guess. Uh, you could get the array dot length and you will get the number of elements in the array. But since we have multi dimensions here and every dimension uh, could have different figures, we could get the length of the first part of the array and then the length of the second indexer of the array. So in this case, if we have a two dimensional arrays, we need to scan it with at least two nested loops. The first one will scan the rows and the second one will scan the columns. It could be, of course, reversed. That's up to you. And calling them rows and columns is again up to you. But what we get here, if we call get length, we'll get the, the index yeah. dimensions of the current dimension. Number zero is the first, number one is the second. And if this was a three-dimensional, uh, if this was a three-dimensional array, then we could get uh, get length uh, with indexer of two. Sorry, your name? So uh, is this is this clear by how we actually can get? So we could explore once we have an array object like this, like this, which is called array, and that's a bit confusing. Once we have an array object, we can explore the dimensions of this array by calling get length. And the first, um, the number here would specify which of the dimensions you want to check for. So the first one will get three, the second one will get four, and that's how we can create our self-dynamic loop to scan all the elements in the array serially by uh, one by another. I think this is, by the way, again, different from what you could do with C++, because in C++, two-dimensional arrays are actually equivalent to single-dimensional arrays, and they could be, fl they could be treated as flats uh, <coughs> because of the, the way the data is stored. But in C Sharp, it's not so, uh, not, not so trivial. So this is how we can scan a multi-dimensional array. Um, here is an example that we'll see live in just a minute. Um, we are populating uh, we are populating a matrix which is a two-dimensional array of integers. First we are reading from the console um, the number of rows, then we are reading from the console the number of columns, then we are constructing an array object and initializing it with rows and columns. Um, <coughs> here we have a temporary variable input number that will hold the, the user's input. So we are going into a nested loop here. So we know the rows and we know the columns and we are just counting from zero to rows minus one and from zeros to columns minus one. Is that clear, by the way? Y minus one? Why are we counting here from zero to, to minus one? Yeah, zero is the first <coughs> index, and minus one is actually we have five objects, so we count from zero to four. Um, and actually, we have here a operator of 
smaller than, less than, not equal to. So once we get to to the same number, once it's equal, once our row counter here is equal to rows, then we're out of the loop. So we'll reach up to the level of minus one and then we'll stop. <coughs> uh, so we are reading from the console on every time a uh, number that represents a number in the array. Um, we are parsing it into a number and we're putting it in the right place in our matrix. And printing it out is pretty much the same. Um, we are going through the same. Actually, this printout doesn't rely on the rows and columns that we knew on the previous loop. It just takes the array and tries to resolve it itself. So if on the previous we got it from the user and we have here a variable called rows and variable called columns, and here we use those variables, on well, the next loop we don't use them. We just take the we take our matrix and we try to interpret them ourselves by getting the first dimension and then the second dimension and we run across all the objects and print them out. And we print them on one line with console write and as soon as we are done with the inner loop we go down one line so we'll get it in a nice matrix structure. Clear, right? Not so, com not so complicated so far. So let's see it. Someone's at the door. Is this recording? Hi, what's your name? Sorry? good to have a sorting. We'll see some sortings soon. Thank you, Mr. 327. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a number. I'm a person. <laughs> Here's the here's the the sample, and uh, let's see it run with my favorite debugger. As soon as Visual Studio comes to life, and let's try to place it in a nice placement. All right, now we're ready. So. We're getting the number of rows, and here we're reading them. Um, what do you suggest? How many rows should we collect? Five. <coughs> Good number. What's going on? Here's my debugger. I press enter, okay. How many columns? Two is enough. Two is enough. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so here are our variables, five and two. And now our matrix, oh, let me do like this see better. So here's our matrix and after it's initialized we can see its dimensions and we can see all the objects inside. Very nice, they're all initialized to zero because that's the default of integers and this is an array of integers. Now we are counting, we have here temporary loop variables, row and call. So we are counting from zero until we reach the equal of five. Once we reach the equal, we're out of the loop. So until four. Then we're counting from zero till two. So actually it will stop 
after one. And now we're reading from the console again. The number. It's already parsed. Okay, so we are reading from the console here and we are wrapping it in an int parse here. So actually we are reading and parsing at the same call. That's okay, as long as we can assume that the user is putting the right input, and once we put here something invalid, this thing will crash. But for the demonstration, it's, it's okay. So our element is already converted into an integer, so we just take it and put it. Actually, we could have, in this case, we didn't even have to use a temporary variable here, we could have just placed it directly into the array. Um, so this line could have been up here, just if we're already reading it, parsing it, and putting it, we could just immediately shove it into the array and get it, get it over with. So we're putting it right now in 0 and 0, and we can see it here in the right place. And you can see that this is actually a flat collection, as if it's a flat collection of elements just that each one of them has two specifier indexes to get to. Um, and since this is a long procedure to debug every line, we'll just continue putting numbers, maybe like this. Okay, we've reached. So we have filled our two over five which means 10 elements in our matrix. And now we're printing them. Printing is much easier. Again, uh, this, this, one uses, this one uses the rows and columns, uh, which we didn't see. Um, in the presentation, they didn't use the rows and column variables as they do here. But we could see here, for example, in the watch, let's take a look at our matrix. If we call get length with zero, we'll get our first dimension. If we call it to with one, we'll get the second dimension. So we could actually take any array and build any kind of nested loop here with any sizes, and we could infer the size ourselves. And what will happen if I put here two? Uh, so here we are just scanning through again from ro all the rows and all the columns. These, by the way, are different variables from the previous loop because these variables live only in the mm -hmm. scope of the loop. And we're printing them out pretty much. Once we're done with the line, we're going one line down. We don't have to really go through the whole loop because that would be just boring. Once we're done, let's put our Let's put our breakpoint after the loop. So we can see now the printout of the array. We can see our five different rows and two different columns. Um, they're not well um, structured, but we could have used the tricks for console input and output to make them with the right width, and, and then they would really look like a table. But for this demo, I think this is quite, quite understandable, right? Any questions? All right, just making sure, because previous time I stopped recording after 23 minutes and that was not good. All right, so now we start doing some tricks. Um, we have an array, a two by, uh, we have a one, two, three, six over three. So we have a matrix with six, uh, with three rows and six columns. And we want to find the two by two platform. That means that we want to cut out out of this uh, out of this array a smaller array with two by two uh, of the maximum sum of elements. <coughs> That's already starting to resemble like a, a 
one of the exercises. <coughs> so let's see how this is done. Um, okay, since we are um, since we are talking about integers, uh, we will just like in any minimum and maximum tasks, um, unless you use some function like max or min. Um, in all the other tasks where you have to do your own work in finding the minimum and maximum, uh, you'll have to use some variable and store to it always the highest value that you could find. So in this case, it's called best sum. And since we are looking for a high maximum here, we'll start with the lowest possible. So we'll initialize it to the minimum value of integer, which I don't remember what it is. Uh, uh, 50. Never mind. Okay. So now we are scanning our array. Again, we have a nested loop. We don't have to go into all the details. We're running on the first um, on the first uh, dimension, which we calculate with get length. And since we want to reach up to get length minus one, and here on the get length minus one for the columns. So we are actually scanning all the objects in the array. Um, <coughs> the reason, okay, we see here, for example, that we have, again, this, this, is, this is a arithmetic tricky part. Uh, we see that we have six objects, right, in the line. And the first, okay, let's go into the inner loop. We have here, counting from zero, and matrix get length will return six because we have a length of six. So we have to count actually from zero to five and since we have here uh, smaller than, we will stop after five because once we reach six, we're actually going out of the loop. But we're not going up to six, we're going up to five because we have here a minus one. So get length will return six but minus one is going up to five. Um, so we are actually scanning the array from right to from left to right up to the almost last element. Do you understand why? <laughs> Do you understand my question? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. So That's a good start. Hmm? Three and three. It will be minus two. Yeah. For example. Yes. Okay. Good. Correct. Because <laughs> um, we check the next. Uh, yes, we because we have to check a two by two yeah, inside. Nice. We don't have really have to scan to the end because once we reach to the end, we cannot create a two by two from that point. So we'll scan yeah. from the right, from the left side to the right, mm -hmm. and we'll reach here, and this is the last point where we can actually create a two by two uh, yeah. array. So that's why we don't reach the end on the row scanner and that we don't reach the end on the column scanner. Once we have that, we are running on all the elements in the array. So we're starting from here to here and from here to here. And we are counting the sum. So we have the element on the point in the loop where, where we've reached and all the elements around it the one in the column next to it the one in the row next to it and the one in the row and column next to it so we are constructing a sum of all these four elements if this sum is greater than our so far collected maximum then our so far collected maximum will get updated. And that's it. Not a very tricky trick, but for the sake of presentation, it's okay. Is it clear? All right, let's see it. <coughs> the good part here is that we don't have to 
start typing into the console because the array is already um, initialized for us. So let's see. So here's our matrix again um, initialized all the values as they are. Okay, we are collecting here three variables. Uh, one of them is the best sum, uh, which is just like what we saw, and we're initializing it to minus uh, this, because we are for sure heading for more than that. It'll be, mm, it is possible to get to uh, int, int minimum in the array, but um, we're assuming this is the lowest we can get. And then we have the best row and the best column, so we can also extract the coordinates of the where this array is, where this maximum smaller array is. So we have our two loops nested, <coughs> just like we saw. We already saw what get length does and why we're doing it with minus one. And the collection on each step of the loop is collecting the sum of these four elements. Okay, since we are now getting a higher value than integer minimum, um, then we're going to collect it. That means we're updating the sum to be, so far, the best is 10, and the row and column where it exists. Once we find a better sum, we'll update the sum and the row and the column. Okay, once this is done, Let's, let's go here. Once we're out of both loops, we can see what is collected. The maximum we could find is 33, and it is on row 2, column 2, which I think is what we saw in the presentation as well. And we're just printing out to the screen. Okay, what we're printing here is the actual array, because we know where it is. We can use the best row and best column specifiers that we've collected in order to get it out. Questions? Is it clear? Mm -hmm. All right. If it's not us, I mean, at any point, feel free to ask. Another type of uh, multidimensional array is a little bit different, is the jagged array. <coughs> um, sometimes also called array of arrays, um, which makes sense. As you can see, the definition of a, a jagged array here, it has two different specifiers. These are not dimensions in a cube. These are array, and then there is another array specifying the array of the first array. So in that case, for example, here, we are defining a jagged array of integers. And that means that we have, once we initialize it, we have three different array integers, uh, integer arrays. And each one of them we, uh, behaves as a single dimensional array. So the first one is initialized to a single dimensional array with three elements. The second one is initialized to a single dimensional array with two elements. And the third with five elements. The beauty of it is that it can, it can, uh, it can represent a matrix which is not even. So as you can see, you can't really see, right? But um, there are some, some of those are in different colors. Some of the cubes are in different color. Uh, <coughs> it's very hard to see it, but it just representing that we have here an array, which on the first row, these are actually active. And on the second, only the first two are active. And on the third, only one is active. And on the fourth, 
three are active. So we can create such dynamically sized matrices to hold all kinds of data. Um, that could be useful if you want to store data which is not exactly cubicle shaped. And that could be useful to save space. Yeah, since, uh, again, um, the, the elements of the jagged arrays are arrays. So once you have an array which is not initialized, those are actually nulls. So in this case, we are creating a jagged array with n different arrays. And we are going through each of them, and we are initializing them. As you can see, we are initializing them with the size which is equal to the counter. So the first one will have zero elements, and the first one, the second one will have one element, then two elements, then three, then four, then up to n minus one. It's not a big trick, and it actually, it's really an array of arrays. Now, do we have a live demo? That is the question. Okay, I think that these demos are not listed in the presentation, but we will have to go through them and see them. Is this a jagged array? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. You what? It's just an array. Hmm. Array. Okay. <clears throat> you know what's a Pascal triangle? Yeah. yeah. Who doesn't know? Okay, that's enough. That's good enough for me to, to make a quick explanation. Um, Pascal triangle is a triangle of numbers um, where I think that. Uh, the out, okay, once we have our triangle sides, both sides of the triangle contain the number one in each of their cells. And that requires Okay, so this is our triangle. So, so this is the base of the Pascal triangle. It's a triangle of cells. Uh, this could be represented nicely with an array. And since this triangle is represented by um, arrays of different sizes, then a jagged array is a good, good use for that. Um, and each of the cells on the exterior part uh, contains the number one. And each of the cells in, I think I drew it quite wrongly. Mm, yeah, because these cells don't really match. But <laughs> we understand. Yeah, OK. Every cell contains the sum of the s two cells above it. OK, so if this was drawn correctly, we would have here two cells which are number one, and here we would accumulate one and one, and here we would accumulate one and the one above it. So we'll see it. We'll see a 
hopefully if this example works, we'll see a real one and we'll see how it works and uh, what it contains. But first, let's see how it's structured. Sorry about the bad drawing. But, uh, so we are starting with our triangle, uh, which will be an array. Now, here, this code, as you can see, is no, not so structured like we are used to. Um, we have our main here, which prints uh, and does some actions. This is where our program runs. But we are using a class here, which is something that so far I don't think we have used in any of the examples. <coughs> so this file contains, uh, defines a class called Pascal Triangle. And th this class has members. Um, you will get to know classes much closer in one of the next lessons, but um, do you, okay, who doesn't know the, uh, <laughs> I promise I won't draw on the board. Uh, who doesn't know the idea behind object-oriented classes? Okay. So, I'll give a brief talk because we have, since we're looking at code anyway, um, and we'll get to know classes much deeper. Classes usually come to uh, what we call encapsulate data and ideas. Um, it is good in order to make use of programmable objects to resemble real life objects. Uh, in, the, in the sense that they have their own functions and their own properties. So if I am, for example, a person and I have a first name and a last name, I have an address, I have an age, I have a race, I have a sex, if I'm lucky. <laughs> <coughs> um, so I could define a class that will hold those properties and that way I could create objects which will each one of them contain those properties and they could contain different values. Um, uh, similarly, they can have some functionalities. So for example, if I define a class of a car, I can have a functionality of drive, stop, reverse, blink, turn on the wipers, turn off the wipers. These functionalities are encapsulated in an object which is called car. And the definition of such objects in programming world is classes. So for example here, we are talking about a class which we are defining, which is called Pascal Triangle. And this Pascal Triangle holds properties. Uh, in this case, they're called fields because they are private. That means that only the class itself can access them. One of them is called height and it's an integer. And the other one is called triangle and it's a long, jagged array. So. This means that this class probably can have some use of these values. It also has uh, methods that can be called. For example, once it uh, has a triangle or array, which is here, this jagged array, it can print it out to the screen. The beauty of it is that I can create as many as I want Pascal triangle objects based on this class, each one will have its own triangle array, its own height, and whenever I call a function, it will call its internal supported function, for example, print triangle in itself, and it will do whatever it, it says to do here. This is the beauty of encapsulation, um, which is a big part of object-oriented programming. Uh, for example, another method here is a calculate triangle, which takes the array and builds up all the elements inside it. So what we can see here, the main function, what it does, is creates a new instance of this Pascal triangle. This is how we instantiate a class, and from now on, this, this one here will be called an object. We've seen such uh, initializations of classes for example, you can also initialize an integer in this way. You can put int 
i equals new int and then we can specify a number in brackets you can do the same with strings i think we've all so seen some uh, some of these samples in the previous lessons <coughs> but once we have that once we create a new instance a special function is called which is called constructor which is defined here the constructor has the same name as the class and this one gets an integer argument once it gets the argument it can do whatever it wants with it for example it populates this field here with the value received in the argument is this clear pretty much we'll see it run in one time and we'll see how it how it really works so we are initializing our jagged array here inside the constructor this will happen for every new triangle that you create you can specify it a different height and it will create a different um, a different array inside it once we have this triangle object we can call its supported method for example make the calculation that means fill the array in this case and print it out to the screen the beauty of objects is that they can be very dynamic and uh, you will see a lot about objects inheritance and how they can be morphed from one to another and how they can be supporting of uh, different interfaces uh, but for this example, we see here a very simple kind of, of uh, class. And I think it might be a little clearer if we let it run. <coughs> and we'll see what happens in every step. I hope, I hope it's pretty clear what I was trying to explain. Okay. <coughs> So in this case, we can see already that we're going to hold an object. Right now, it's null. And since we are calling the new here, the new operator, we are going to call the constructor function. And we're providing the value of 10 because we can see, I'll stop it for a moment, that when I write the code and when I want to call the constructor by instantiating it, like this, <coughs> I can see that the development environment helps me and tells me that I need to specify here an integer which is going to be called height for now. So let's pause again. And let's step into what's happening when this is called. So we are now inside this function. Actually, we can see that it is nested inside our class. This is where the class starts. Somewhere down there is where it ends. Inside it, we have defined those private variables, those private fields, and we're going to address them. Once you address a field inside a class, you have to specify it with the word this. It's not necessary, it's not mandatory, but in some cases it is. And it's always a good practice to use this when you are referring to this current object. So if we are now in an object of Pascal Triangle class, this will refer to this instance that we are creating now. We can see that the value here in the argument is the one that I supplied. <coughs> Now we are going to this dot height, which is the variable which is defined up here, the private one, and we are assigning a value to it, which is the value given here. Even though they are the same, they are written the same way, and they live in the same realm, that means that here I can access this height and this height, and they are exactly the same spelling in the same case of letters, um, they are different. There are different variables. That's a little bit confusing. And that's not the best practice to use variables with the same name, exactly the same name, at the same area of the program where they can be accessed at the same way. 
but this one will populate this one and we can see that after this line is executed this height contains now 10 alright <coughs> now we have our private jagged array here which is yet to be initialized it's now and this initialization will place the first number of it to be 11 so here we are with a jagged array of 11 arrays they are not initialized yet now we're going through all of them and we are initializing them into arrays okay let's let's get to the end of this loop we'll see now that our jagged array contains a triangle in a way because the first member create uh, contains an array of one long <coughs> and the second contains an array of two longs three and four five six these are the internal arrays if I go here to number five I'll see that inside it I have another array of six elements so far what we've done here is is it clear mm. using the class is a little bit abstract maybe but just to understand the structure of the code here and um, how we are stepping in now we are at the last step of this function which we call the constructor so once we are done executing the constructor we're back to where we it was called which was here so this line is now executed and we can see that our object here is of type Pascal triangle and we can see its properties we can see its height and this little lock here says that this is a private property that cannot be accessed outside this and we can see that it has a triangle which is also a private property and we can see it's a jagged array with 11 arrays inside it we can also see the arrays themselves just like we did if I were to create another object here I would duplicate this line and I'll call this Pascal triangle 2 and I'll give it 20 once this code is executed I have two different arrays two different Pascal triangles. The first one is the one we just saw with its own properties inside it. The second one is a different one with different properties, with different arrays. They don't know about each other. They live in their own world. It's again, imagine for example, a person with its own properties, names, or a car with its own functionalities. So those are unrelated to each other, but they are of the same type and they support the same fields, properties, and methods. So in that case, we could call a method on each of them. We could go to Pascal's triangle <coughs> 2, and we could call any of the supported methods. For example, print triangle, we could call for this specific one, and maybe we will. So the second thing going on here, once the object is initialized is calculate the triangle that means build fill the data inside the jagged array and we can step into this function this is a function of the class it is defined in the type Pascal triangle and it is called from this specific object okay <coughs> Here's the function, starts here and ends here. <coughs> the code is pretty much understandable. Um, so the only thing to follow here is what's going on inside and to understand that this is a whole unit inside 
the class. So we are putting on the first part of the triangle at the top at the peak, we're putting one. That's the one we put up here. That's the first jagged array in the first place of it. And since this jagged array has only one object in it, we're going now to the rest and we're going to fill them. <coughs> so the algorithm here is the less important one in this case. We could go into the understanding of the fact that we are going through all the rows and all the columns of our array and we are actually treating treating it as rows and columns as if we would treat rows and columns in a matrix in a two-dimensional array but we are actually using those rows and columns to specify indexers inside our jagged arrays so that means that any cell in the row below the current one but in the current column let me make changes. We are adding to it the current cell. And the next cell with the next row and the next column, we are also putting it the current column value. Once this loop finishes running, you can see that our arrays are now filled. And we can see each of the lines. Each of these ar arrays represents a line in the triangle. So the first one, the peak, the top, contains one. The second row contains one and one, contains two cells. Then we have three cells. <coughs> So on the sides we have one and one, but in the central one we have the sum of one and one which were above it. We're going into this cell. Then we have, again, one and one, and three, which is actually one plus two from both sides. So actually we are, mm, I'm going to show how it looks would be a better explanation. So this is what it looks like if I were to draw it correctly. <coughs> we have the one at the top and every cell contains the sum of the two cells above it. So these two actually contain one because there are no two cells above but this cell contains two because it contains the sum of these two cells and this one contains three because it's two plus one and here it's two plus one and then it's four because it's three plus one and then three plus one and three and three become six so this is how we calculate the calculation itself is really not the important part here um, but if you want to look at it into it again uh, here it is, just taking the row below the one we are in and placing the sum of the current column, the current cell into the lower row and into the lower row on the next column, pretty much. Okay. <coughs> the third method which is called the sprint triangle and it's also a member method of the Pascal triangle class and what it does is simply scanning and printing nicely the triangle as we saw right now in the console again this is a this is just a nested loop that scans our jagged array um, and just prints prints it nicely. The only thing here is that we are printing some padding here. 
um, if you remember from the console input and output lesson, um, we're putting a padding which is calculated by uh, the current uh, the current row. So we are we are creating a smaller and smaller padding on the left, so that we're giving a padding to our <coughs> printed objects, and we're giving a constant width for each of the elements that we are printing. And on every line, we go down one line. And that's why we are resulting in a nice printout. OK. Just to show you that I could actually call these two functions on my second array as well. Like this. In which case, I would get the first one and the second one on screen. This one starts getting too messy because it's too wide, and also the numbers are wider than three pixel, uh, three characters, and the spacing is actually calculated according to three characters maximum. But the top part is still okay. But these are two different arrays, two different triangle objects which are created separately. They don't know about <coughs> each other, but each one of them knows how to print itself and how to calculate itself. Questions about this uh, little bit harsh example? Okay, <coughs> here there's an example of a jagged array without a code example, just to make it, uh, to make it interesting. Uh, for example, <coughs> we have a set of numbers, these are the numbers, and we want to check um, the remainder when dividing it, each one of them by three. So what we want to create is a jagged array like this, which we have three different arrays in it. The first one will contain uh, all the numbers, which when we divide by three, we get a remainder of zero. The second one will contain all the numbers that when we divide by three, we get a remainder of one. And the third one will, create, uh, will contain all the numbers, which when we divide by three, we get a remainder of two. That's, that's as much as you can get when you divide by three. So. <coughs> So this jagged array will be dynamically constructed in such a way that it will hold the numbers in their own arrays with their own sizes. Uh, it's nice and handy, and it's, uh, this structure starts to remind another data structure which is used in other cases, which is called the hash table, which could contain objects according to their specifications. Um, that's a good example of what you could do with the jagged array if you really want to hold numbers after dividing them by three, for example. So <coughs> we'll look at the example only here now. <coughs> First of all, we go through each of our numbers, and we want to make sure how many are there which divide by three um, what we have here is, I'm guessing, a single, this is a single dimension array called sizes, and it will hold the how many numbers have, uh, how many numbers have a division by three, mm, yeah. This, this array will contain these numbers. Um, it will contain three elements. And we are getting here, each of our numbers, we are getting the remainder of the division by three here. And we are incrementing the count 
on the element in the place of the remainder. So the, once we get here a remainder of zero, we're going to the sizes in the place of zero and we are incrementing its value. So actually this one will count for us how many numbers with the remainder of zero, one, and two are there in the group. No, this goes to the sizes in the place of the remainder, 0, 1, or 2, gets the value and increments it. Mm. This sizes, how do I, this, how do I type? It's something like, bad place. Something like that. This will be an array with three mm -hmm. with three items inside it. Zero, one, and two. And it contains just three integers, three numbers. So in that case, we're going to each of the remainders that we find and we increment the value in this place in the array. So we are just keeping track of how many numbers we have with the remainder of zero, how many numbers we have with the remainder of one and, and two, mm -hmm. and so on. Yeah. Now, <coughs> I guess, I guess there is something missing in this code. We are again going over the numbers and we're again checking the remainder for each of them. Uh, okay, this is actually our jagged array that we are filled that we are ah. I put it yellow. This is our jagged array that we are filling. We have to find the first part of this array is the remainder. So we have to find out which of the arrays to use. And then we have to find out where to put it in the array, here or here or here or here or here. So we are checking First of all, we are checking the remainder of the division by three. Then, we have, okay, this is, this is a bit complicated. We have the positions counter. <laughs> okay, we have another one dimensional array here. which counts something like this is how it's structured and it's again a three a th a th a three elements array and it counts where we have reached in the filling of this array so once we put two elements in in this array it will count two and so we will know that the next one will have to come at the index of 3 and the next one will come at the index of 4 for this array. So this first we get the index on the positions in the remainder so we'll know that for this array where we have reached filling and this will be used as the index of where to put it and the remainder itself will be used as which of the three arrays to put it in. And this is how we populate it. One question, wouldn't it be uh, easier in principle for this kind of task to be done with a kind of list maybe? 
so we can add more yes uh, it would be a list a list is much more dynamic you can add and subtract it could have been an array of lists yeah, which a jagged list. yes you can do an array of lists and it would be much more elegant than this solution but uh, for the sake of using uh, jagged arrays uh, this example in a, a little bit of a clumsy way keeps track of each of the arrays how many elements each of them already has um, and so for each number we check where to put it on which remainder part and then we check which index part is free for this for this remainder we put it there and then we increment the remainder in the in this position so that we will know that we have reached we filled this cell now this cell is the next one free is it is it clear <laughs> I wonder there is no live demo. Maybe we should make one. That will be that will make it clear. Let's try to make it quickly. Okay, no classes here, so that reminds me of a very dirty, geeky joke about a classroom of software engineers where one of the guys goes to one of the girls and grabs her boobs and she says, hey, that's private. And he says, well, I thought we were in the same class. <laughs> 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 now let's take this code and let's place it here and we'll fill in the blanks and also let's take the number the set that we have and let's let's try to build this code because is a bit confusing. So first we have our numbers, so I guess it's an array of numbers. Let's initialize it with our numbers. So that's the first thing. This is the group that we have. <coughs> Second, we want to know how many of each of these element uh, of our set <coughs> um, relates to a specific remainder. So let's put another array here called sizes, for example. It will be of si uh, three, three integers. another one which will be just exa exactly the same will be called positions and this is our jagged array Write it like this. Write it like this. So this is the code, actually, as it should have been written, <coughs> I think. Uh, we have our set of numbers. Try to make the screen move as, least, as less as possible, not to make you dizzy. Puking in class is not a good idea. So this is our set of numbers. And this is our jagged array that will actually contain for zero, all the numbers when we divide by zero, 
the, uh, when we divide by 3 it will give us 0 and on the first place all the numbers that are dividing by 0 will give us 1 and so on and so forth. The two other helping arrays that we have here are the sizes and the positions. Sizes will determine um, how many of the numbers on each of the arrays of the jagged array should be and positions will remember when w where was the last position in this array that we have placed something. Um, one thing that we have to do once we initialize the sizes is we have to initialize the numbers by remainder so now that we know how many there are in each one of them. So that's a missing step here that we have to do. sizes we have so we are just a small loop and we are initializing Okay, what will come here? <coughs> mm -hmm. Not quite. Not finished. So, <coughs> uh, let me just wrap it nicely here. Okay, now it makes sense. So, first of all, we are counting how many there are in each of the remainder's parts here. Once we know that we have one with the remainder of zero, three with the remainder of one, and five with the remainder of two, we go here and we initialize our jagged array, each of it, the jagged array arrays, and we initialize it by the currently collected size. So I'm iterating <coughs> here to each of them. Once we have that, we have our array initialized. We are going to process our numbers. We're going to each one of them. We check the remainder. We check where we can place it. That is the last position on this remainder section that is available. So we go to our numbers. We put it in the first, in the in the array of the remainders that matches this division on the index which is the last free position we place it then we go to the positions counter and we increment it so that we will know next time we'll put it on a higher is this more clear now? we'll see it running and hopefully it will be even more clear this is a bit hardcore and it's many arrays in one piece of code but let's see uh, maybe we will place our arrays here and we'll see what we're doing we're going to each of the numbers let's put also the current number So we are now on the first number in our group, it's 1, and we're checking the remainder with the division. We see that it is 1, of course. So our sizes right now, we don't know how many we have on each one of those classes, so we are incrementing <coughs> the one with the right remainder. Here's the change. You can also always follow the change in the watches area by it becoming red. Okay, next number. Two. Remainder is two. 
So we, we should increment this one. And then we are 3. We increment the 0. Then we are 4. Is it? Yeah, okay. Then we are 55. So 55, the remainder of the division is 1. So we will increment the 1. In the end of this loop, let's go to the end of this loop. We know how many numbers we have for each of the remainder's parts. Okay. So we have to initialize those arrays to correspond with these numbers because we will have to place two numbers which with division by 3 will give 0. We have to give four numbers which with division by 0 will give 1. And we have three numbers with division by 3 will give 2. So this loop will just initialize each of those, hopefully. 2, 4, and three. So here is our jagged array structured and it's empty. So we're done with this loop. Now we're down here. Again we're going through our numbers. Again we're checking for each one of them what is the remainder. So we're starting with one and the remainder is one. The last position in the remainder of ones, now we're looking here, is zero. So the first place, the first index of this array is free. You understand the relation here? What is the, what is the um, purpose of this array? And what's the purpose of the others? So we'll place it in array number one on the first index. We'll take the number and we'll put it. We can see that it's put. Here it is. Now we take the positioning counter and we increment it. So we'll know the next time we have to put a number in this array, it should be in the place in the index number one. More clear now? I hope. Anybody wants coffee? Um, yeah, I see. Uh, let's, uh, because the cafeteria is going to close soon, and we'll take a short break. You'll refresh yourself, because mm -hmm. I see that jagged arrays are heavy on you. And we will, well, have your coffee, let's. So, uh, congratulations for surviving the first part of the array the multidimensional array lecture. Um, I think there could have been lighter examples, but uh, the samples are a little bit messed up. So we've seen some, uh, <coughs> we've seen some uh, jagged arrays in not a very well explained example. And we've seen um, the, the triangle, which was also not very well, um, I think could have been we could have used easier samples to, to explain the concept, but I hope that so far the concept is understood and at least how the arrays are structured and used. And maybe the last example with the, with the dividers and the jagged array could have been uh, quite explained in the end. So, is it counting? So we'll see uh, we'll see more of that in the, in the exercise uh, session. But uh, and uh, and if any uh, any of you have more questions about what we've seen so far, you can feel free to ask at any point because it could be interesting for the rest of the people as well. Uh, yeah. I guess that depends. Lists give more functionality in a way. Arrays are easy to use, and they're handy, and they are performant. 
I guess that depends on your on your need. You could use an array of lists. Uh, you could use a jagged array. You could use a multi-dimensional, two-dimensional array and just place data in in it. Using lists? No. <laughs> Complexity in, in terms of performance or complexity in terms of being complicated? <laughs> uh, well, no, arrays are quite straightforward. As you could see, these examples that we just saw are... I mean, they are complex to explain at certain, at certain point, but once you look into it, arrays are quite simple to understand. They're well-structured. They have indexers, and, and they put your data in a quite a well-defined well structure. So arrays are cool, and they are very widely used. Um, so that really depends on, on your implementation, on your needs. You could use lists. You could use arrays. Actually, C Sharp and the .NET frameworks has a whole, um, a whole um, library of collections and handling collections and you can make your own collections and we haven't even talked about generic collections and uh, so you can make your own collections and your own enumerations so that uh, you could you could build your own loops enumerators um, which I think we might even discuss very slightly now in this part but really the, the, the implementation depends on your on you and your needs and you are the developer and you should find the best the best implementation according to the requirements whether to use array or list is many times up to you a list is more dynamic an array is well structured and it's high performance so really up to you so in this last part I think it's the last part. Uh, we will explore a little bit of the array class and we'll see some things that we can do with arrays. Now, <coughs> since I, I already mentioned in a few words the concept of the class, um, array, just like any other object in the C sharp language, whether it's integer, string, uh, byte, uh, float, an array is a class and it has its properties and it has its methods that you can use so we're going to see a little bit of that and what things are supported by array by the array class and what can be done with it so all the arrays inherit from one major class called array and it has all the basic properties and all the basic functionalities of all the arrays that you'll be using in the language so once you define your own array it actually inherits. Inheritance is also something that you'll be discussing when you, when you talk about classes, but let's just say that inheriting a class means that you are making your own implementation of a certain class and you get all the um, properties from the parent class. That means that there is somewhere defined a class of, called array and it has all the basic functionalities of all the arrays and once you create your own array, you automatically get those functions and pr properties to your own array as well. So that's the idea of inheritance of classes, which you'll see much deeper when you reach to it. But let's just say that all the arrays in the language that are being used have uh, common functions and common properties. And we'll be exploring a few of them. Um, we've seen, for example, the get length method that gives you the dimension of uh, the number of elements in each of the dimensions of the array. So if you have a one dimension array, you can use the length property and you will get the number of items in the array. But if you have more than one dimension, you can get a length of each of those dimensions of course, these will also work for jagged arrays because the are jagged arrays are just arrays like every other array. And a jagged array has arrays built into it. So you could use those functions and you could use those properties for each one. Uh, 
So get length will get us how many objects are on a specific dimension. So if we have a two-dimensional array, we have one, we have two different lengths, um, which we called rows and columns, and we can get the amount of each of those. And if you want to know how many dimensions actually the array has, you could use the rank property. So you could explore whether you're dealing with a two-dimensional, three-dimensions, and so on. And then for each of those, you could get the size. Okay, a little more advanced. <coughs> uh, get enumerator. That's a, a little bit more basic um, and a little more advanced than what we could discuss right now. Uh, I could tell that uh, collections, many collections in the C sharp language um, are enumerables and they contain a, they implement okay the right way to say that they implement an interface called I in enumerator their objects uh, contain an, their objects implement an interface called I enumerator um, and that allows you to scan through objects in loops for example when we are doing a for each loop this uh, enumerator of the array is used. Um, this enumerator can do a few things. It can go to the beginning of the array and it can get you the next element in the array. You can implement your own enumerators and you can implement your own functionality and your own algorithms on how to get to the first element and which element will be the next. But with arrays, uh, this enumerator is given and you can get the enumerator of your array and you can play with it directly with get enumerator. Uh, if you want, you can see maybe a small example of what it is exactly, or not exactly. Uh, binary search. <coughs> Actually, there are two functions of all the arrays. One of them is called index of, and the other is called last index of. And those will search for the first or the last position in the array of a certain element. So if I have an array of numbers, and I want to find the number 32 inside the array, I can call index of, and I can find where is the first index of this number. I can also call last index of, and I can find the last place where this number appears in the array. It returns the value of the index. Of the index. It will tell you on the fifth place this element exists. And it doesn't have to be a number. It could be a more complex item in the array. It could be a complex class that you have an object and you want to see if this object is in this array. You can search for it and it will say, okay, this object exists in the array. It is in number three. Well, that means in the third position in the array. <coughs> uh, there is also a function called binary search which searches again for elements inside the array, uh, this function assumes that your array is sorted. And if your array is sorted, that means that the objects inside it are ordered. Uh, if they are numbers, they're ordered by numbers. And if they're strings, they're ordered alphabetically. Um, and of course, you can, you can implement your own order algorithms over the array. Once your array is sorted, it will pretty much do a, uh, the same thing that index of does, but it does it much more efficiently. Uh, the binary here, if I'm not mistaken, is, uh, says that we're using a binary search algorithm here. So it is much more efficient, and if you know or don't know binary search trees, which are a, a known subject in algorithms and data structures on all computer sciences. Uh, if you search for elements in a sorted binary tree, you'll get a much better um, complexity than if you search for them serially in a collection. So um, this algorithm of binary search takes advantage of, of this uh, enhanced performance. And it can find, in a sorted array, it can find um, a given element in a very good timing. 
uh, copy, um, can copy, um, does copies an array, um, copies elements from an array to another. Uh, here we have a few, um, a few other um, functions. Reverse, actually you could implement your own reverse of an array function, but, uh, and I think that in the single dimensions array, you had a sample of reversing an array, um, but you could actually reverse a whole array yourself by calling reverse. You could call clear that will null nullify all the elements in the array at once. Uh, create instance is a function that creates a new array. It could be instead of using what we saw here declaratively saying new int and putting the brackets, you could create an array with a create instance method by specifying all the parameters that you want for your array. Um, deeper looking into that, arrays implement the f those interfaces. That means <coughs> um, that they have some functionalities. They, all the arrays have to implement functionalities which are defined in, in those uh, interfaces. Interfaces are another aspect of the language which we haven't covered yet and uh, that you'll have to get familiar with, but it's a bit early. Um, but let's just say that interfaces are like contracts. Interfaces say, okay, you are an array and you want to support the iList interface. These are the methods that you have to implement inside. Or if you want to have a clonable, you will have to implement specific methods. And so that once you implement them, your array can be, uh, your object or array in this case, can be um, determined to have them and to be used them. It's a bit complex to explain without knowing much about classes and about member me methods and functions and interfaces, but we'll get to those a bit later. <coughs> Arrays could be uh, sorted by a number of uh, ways. Um, the, the ways of uh, sorting arrays um, de is defined by how the elements in the arrays are compared. And you can define your own comparison methods. For example, if I have a group of strings, so I have an array of strings, <coughs> could be names, but I could sort them by first name, or if the strings contain first and last name, I could sort by last name. Uh, if I have a, an array of if I can define a new class of person, so the person can have first name, last name, age, I could sort the array by the people's ages. So once you call the sort method, you can define your own comparer, and you can define your own comparisons, so that it will, be, it will determine how the arrays are sorted. This I think we have in a live demo, but for example, here we have an array of beers and we are printing them out to the screen. There is a function of string which is called join that takes an array and joins all the elements together to one string. Once you have an array of strings that could be quite handy. So we are printing here without looping all the elements of the array just like that. So they are unsorted, and they will be printed in the order that they are defined. Now we are sorting the array, and this is the default sort. And we should see here that the result is the sorted elements. If you define your own class, For example, student. And student can have all kinds of properties. For example, the student's name. And now I have an array of such student objects. I can define my own class of comparison 
we should implement the i comparer interface yes i know it's late and i know that this is quite hardcore and these are things that you haven't encountered yet but again uh, like i mentioned when we have an interface that means that we have to we are forced to implement specific functionality and then any class that can be used which is derived from this class we can assume that it knows how to compare elements of type student and the function that it is forced to implement is called compare and it takes two elements of student type they have to be of the same type and it will return an integer that says how to sort them if the integer is zero that means that we deem that those two objects are equal and if it is smaller than zero then it's the first one is the higher and it's higher than zero then so actually we are running here a comparison by the student's age and we are calling the integer compare to method here which is comparing the age of the first student and the second student and returns the result so <clears throat> in this case we have an array of students here and we are sorting them with a new instance of the student age comparer which is this class so we are creating here an instance of this class and since this class is an i comparer then it can be used here as a sorter so we are sorting the students here by this age the beauty of this is that you can create any class of your own and you can sort it with your own comparer according to any rules that you can implement here so you can build any sort algorithms that you want uh, according to any rules and you can instantly sort your array according to that it's very useful but I I personally think that this is a little bit too early to show all this code right now and it's a little bit too late to show all this code right now too at the same time mm -hmm. <coughs> If you want to really go hardcore, look at this one. Um, <coughs> okay, again, we have the students array, okay, and we have the array.sort, which is a function of the, the, this is the basic array, the parent of all the arrays, the, the holy father of all arrays in the world is this array class, and it has a function called sort. And since I'm calling it directly on the class name, it means that this is a static method, but I want bore you with talking about static methods right now. So we'll just say that this is a very generic function of sorting an array. So we're taking our array of students here, and we want to know how to sort them, because this class is not string, and it's not an int, and it's not something that we can compare. We have to know how the students are compared and how they are sorted. So here we sorted them by age by providing an age comparer which is a comparer that compares the age property. And here, we are defining some kind of an inline function that takes two elements of type student and makes a comparison by the name property of the first student and the name property of the second student and calls the compare to method of string. So much, this one is pretty much the same as this one. But here we place it inside a function, and the function is placed inside a class, and the class in here implements an interface. Here we're not doing anything of that. We're just placing them inside the line, and we're doing here something called the lambda expression, which is some kind of a dynamic inline functional code which is defined just like that. It's quite an advanced topic in, in C Sharp to know about lambda expressions and it's quite new. It's something that isn't, didn't used to be in the old .NET frameworks of 1 and 2. So this is again a little bit too early, a little bit too late to show this.
but it's nice to show it. We have a live demo, uh, which we've just seen. I think we have a live demo. OK. This is actually the same code that we've just seen. No, it's not. OK, we'll just take a quick look at it. I'm, I will try to make it as quick, quickly as possible. Just don't know why I can't zoom. That's why. OK. So, <laughs> what we have here is an array of numbers. These are one-dimensional arrays. They don't have anything to do with the multi-dimensional arrays that we've talked about today. We're just exploring what arrays can do. So here we are calling array.sort, and we are sorting the numbers. And the numbers is this array, as you can see. And we are creating here an instance of numbers comparer. <coughs> and numbers comparer is a class here, which is an I comparer of type <coughs> integer. And since it is a type, and if, if, you, if I remove this method, I will not be able to build the solution. I'll get an error that this class does not implement the interface member of compare int int. So this is once I once I implement an interface, I am forced to implement the right methods. That's the idea of interfacing. So now anyone who uses this class can count on the fact on what it what this class knows to do. So it has a method of compare two integers and surprisingly <coughs> it compares the numbers remainder with a division of 5. So each of the numbers is divided by 5. We take the two remainders and we see which one is the bigger one, and that's how the numbers are compared. So you, that just shows how you can make your own crazy comparison logics. So here it is. We're taking the numbers, we are sorting them by this compare, and then we are writing the result to the screen numbers sorted by module of five. Great. <coughs> the second thing we do is take the same array of numbers and we sort them. Instead of using our own comparer, we're using a lambda expression delegate here. And we are sorting them by modulo of the division by six, but we are sorting them with the first one, not to the second. So we have reversed the order here. We're taking not the first number, but the second number. So if the second number is the greater, it will come first. Sorry, if the second number is the smaller, it will come first. So we are actually reversing the order. So you can, re you can sort backwards. So here we have the numbers descending according to their remainder after dividing each one of them by six. Yay. And here we have students, which is a, a simple array of strings. And we are sorting them. And we have a special comparer for students <coughs> comparer, which we can see up here. It is, again, a comparison class, so that means it implements I compare, that means it has to implement compare. So what this thing does is takes the student's last name by cutting the strings where the space is. It takes the first occurrence of space in the string and then cuts it from there so we get the last name of each student and then we are comparing their last names. So these students will be sorted by last name. We'll just see it. Just see the results. Wherever it is. Okay. <coughs> 
So here is the result of the first, uh, the first uh, sorting. Um, these are sorted by module 5. So 10 divided by 5 is 0. 5 divided by 5 is 0. 11 divided by 5 is 1. And then we have 1 and 2, which uh, divided by 5 are 1 and 2. So this is the way that these are sorted here. Doesn't make much sense, but maybe somebody needs it. <coughs> and then they are descending, but they are descending by the modular division of 6. So 5 is the first one because 5 divided by 6 gives a remainder of 5. And then 11 because the remainder of division by 6 is 5. And then 10 because it's 4, and then 2 because it's 2, and then 1 because it's 1. So they are descending, and it's a lot of fun. And as you can see, the list of students is sorted by their last names. If we assume that the last name comes after the first space in the string. There's no space. There's not a space. <laughs> Bad. Bad. I have a question. Yes. Find the first algorithm, the bigger number is first. So why is five, 10 and 5, not 5, 10? Okay, good question. In the first algorithms of sorting, we can see that actually they're not really sorted because the first one is, the, is bigger than the second one. We have here 10 and then we have here 5. Why is that? No. Who can explain this? Who dares to explain? <laughs> okay. Maybe if uh, maybe if it's a uh, module of your operation, then the uh, index would. Um, Let me show you one. Okay, since, since we are, they are not sorted by the number value, they are sorted by module 5. That means that each of the numbers is divided by 5, and then we check the remainder of the division. Yes, but they are equal. They are both yes, okay, zero. equal. That's okay, because once you have an array of uh, numbers, and you are sorting them, and you have some of them which are the same, they'll be one after another. Okay, there's so no, uh, there's no it, it rule. There is no rule here yeah. in the comparison that says that five has to come before ten specifically. Mm -hmm. uh, we could add a rule to that and say, okay, if the, the division modulo of five is bigger, and the number itself is also bigger, and then we will get the, the both of them compared. Yes, so. I think that in the array Mm -hmm. mm. so Let's see. Is that true? Yes, it is true. Mm. Yes, but probably that is not the case. And since there is no rule that says between those two which one has to be the first, they, they could be not random, but probably that's what it will produce. Mm -hmm. Since you are not defining a rule here, you are in the hands of the compiler. Mm -hmm. So if you want to make sure that this behavior is correct, because once you are sorting an array, you are completely changing the order inside it. And according to your own rules, if this is the rule, then it could be that 10 will come first in this case. More questions? All right. <coughs> Binary search, as I mentioned, um, let's see. It. Binary search is a is a good way to search an, ele an element inside an array. Uh, given that the array is sorted, if the array is not sorted. Um, then you might get a bad result. Um, because this algorithm uh, relies on the fact that your array is sorted, uh, it will search 
to find your object on the first occurrence. And if you have all the letters, let's say, from A to Z, and you're looking for the letter G, and you've reached the letter X first, it will assume the letter G doesn't exist in the array. So first of all, the array has to be sorted. Once it's sorted, this algorithm produces a, a good timing uh, performance of log of n, um, which is the timing which takes to search a binary tree, binary search tree. So that's quite good. <coughs> and it returns the index just like uh, last index or uh, uh, last, uh, yeah, just like the uh, just like the previous functions that we saw which right now split my head. Um, so it requires to be sorted. And OK, I think we have an example. <coughs> and I think we have a live one, too. So again, uh, what we will see here, I think we better just look at the, at the live example, because it will be much more clear. <coughs> or not. Okay. <clears throat> so, again, we have here some, uh, we have the beers. The first thing we do is sort them, and since they contain strings, there is a default sort for strings that sorts them alphabetically. And we are looking for a specific item we can see where it's found. Let's see it. Oh. Sorry about the dizziness. What's going on here? Okay, so we uh, we could see that a sticker was found in the index 2, and Heineken was not found. That means we got a negative index. And that's OK, because the first beer is Amstel, and then this, and then a sticker, and Heineken is not in the array. So we got the, we got the result quite well. <clears throat> um, okay, here we have. Uh, let me fill this array here. Oof, just a moment. Here. Okay. Oh. So what we have here is an array of numbers, which correspond to the to their index in the array. Actually, the sorted array will be exactly the same, and so. What we have here is a measurement of time. I'll just remove, I'll just give you some more space to see what's going on. OK, what we have here is a comparison of times. Uh, we, have an we have a function that fills an array and then sorts it. And we have a comparison between using <coughs> index of up here and binary search. We have a start and end timing, which uh, starts with the time before the loop and the time after the loop. And the comparison is to see how much is the difference in times between the start and finish of index of 
and start and finish of binary search. <coughs> so now I guess it will be, it can't be so much. Let's, let's do it again because I think my breakpoints have probably ruined it. Let's make a big array, something like 9,000 objects. 9,000. And you can see <coughs> significant time difference between using index of and binary search. Um, so if you have a sorted array and you're looking for something, binary search is much better. And if you don't have a sorted array, then you have no choice. Okay, what more do we have to talk? Uh, best practices. <coughs> uh, when you are working with arrays and you have no objects in the array, uh, it's better to create an array with zero elements rather than null, because <coughs> whoever works with your array will expect an array, and if the object is null, then it could be trouble. Um, so, if you're working with arrays, arrays are well structured. Somebody expects to receive an array. It's better to always use an array with zero elements than none. Arrays are passed by reference. That means that whoever makes changes, uh, they are reference objects in the language. Um, that means that if you have an array object and somebody takes a variable and puts this array into it and makes a change, it actually will change your array as well. That means that arrays are managed in memory all in the same location, and whoever makes changes, changes all of them at once. Uh, there's another method called clone, <coughs> which copies an array to another array. But the problem with that method is that it creates a shallow copy of the array. That means that it copies the references to the objects that means if anybody changes anything in those uh, objects, then it changes the original array as well. So you could implement your own copy method in order to, um, in order to mm, create a good copying of an array to another array. Wasn't there a, a copy method? Uh, yes, there is a copy method. And I'm not sure about it, but we can we can see it. Okay, uh, I'll give a simple. Hmm? It's, it's used in the yes. Uh, yes, it is. This is a small example. This is not related to the samples of the of the um, of the presentation. And it's not provided, I just built it, and I think giving here the name person is wrong. I just give it some name is bad. Hmm. Call it institute. Uh, so <coughs> I've created a small class called institute, and this institute has a name. Let's see it close up. It's a public property. Um, you should be already class ninjas by now, or not. It has a it has a cons small constructor that uh, that constructs a new institute object and just populates the name with a new name that is given here. And I've created a new institute array here, which contains two objects. One of them is called Telerik, and the other called Academy. So these are institute objects inside an array. And I want to copy this array into another array. So I'm using here a few methods of copying. First one, I'm making an array called copy. And I'm using the clone method. The second one, I'm taking an, an array called copy2, which is a new array and I'm copying the values of the first array into the second array. <coughs> you can see that they have the same length. And the third one, 
the most colorful one is I'm creating my own deep copy just to see the difference between copying and deep copying and in copying <coughs> what I do is I create a new array and I convert all the arrays objects the original arrays into cloned new objects I've included my own clone method in my class here which creates actually a new object completely in uh, completely um, unrelated to the current object so that I can clone the current institute into a new institute two different objects which are not related to each other and since I called it clone I also made sure that my class implements the iClonable interface so this is w this is a way to make a deep copying of an array. So let's see what happens now. Here are my three arrays. My original one, I can see the names here and here. The copy one, which contains the two same elements. The copy two, which I created with copy. And the deep copy one, which seemingly is the same. And now I go to the first element of the array and I changed its properties. So obviously since I went to my original array, the original array will contain the changed value. The copied one, since it has been created with clone and clone is a shallow copy, it also got changed even though nobody expected it because it's a different object. The second one, which I created with copy, also got changed. <laughs> and the third one, which I've created with deep copy and created unrelated objects, remained with its original value. So that's about uh, references and how things reference to each other in C Sharp. And many times when you, have re uh, when you have variables which are transferred by reference, when you make change to one of them, um, you make change to the original. And most of the objects, which are complex objects in the language, um, <coughs> are reference objects. That means you make changes, you make changes in all of them. Uh, and this is what is meant in the presentation when it says that you, when you use clone, actually what you do is just make a shallow copy of the object. And they are not really separate objects. You are just copying references. If you want, a real copied unrelated object which is completely independent make your own deep copy method and that's important but that's quite heavy stuff okay <coughs> looks like um, we're done with this part any questions yeah when clone is useful clone is useful when you want, for example, if you have a, a private property of a class and you want to return a reference with another array which references to it. I mean, in, in any case where you have to have two objects in two different places which are unrelatedly working but actually affecting each other, then you could create a clone of your array and two different unrelated code samples can just actually whenever you need certain code to have reference to your array then you could use clone in any other case when you want someone to have just a copy of it to work on it without ruining it then then uh, then you would need a better solution but in some cases you have your array somewhere in some class in some assembly in some way and you want someone else to access it and you want it to be able to make changes in it so you give it by reference so you can create a clone or return a clone or it's just a just a re shallow reference but it's needed sometimes all right more Okay, so 
Uh, now we have some time for exercise session and I'm here so I'm open for questions, help, 